today. Um, thanks, Ekaterina, for, for agreeing to do this talk all the way from Moscow. We really appreciate your time. Um, before we introduce Ekaterina, if we could just have a little bit of housekeeping, please. Could all the, uh, all the attendees keep your, your mics and your videos off, please? Um, you will have an opportunity to ask questions later and you can actually raise your hands if you click on the participants button at the bottom of your screen. On the left, you'll, you can see that you can raise your hand um, and we can see that you want to ask a question. Um, you can also temporarily unmute your mic by pushing the space bar, talking and then letting it go. And I uh, will start with an introduction. Uh, so Ekaterina Pelenkova um, is joining us, as I said, from Moscow. She's a geologist at AMC Consultants. Katya has got 13 years experience in the minerals industry, including nine years working on exploration projects in Russia as part of Intergeo and Norilsk Nickel, and four years in international consulting. She joined AMC Consultants in March 2020, which is really recently. Mm -hmm. Um, prior, yeah, prior to joining AMC, she worked at Micromind Consulting Services and Micron International Consulting Companies, focusing mostly on data management and QAQC systems as part of the JORC and NR43101 public reporting. She combines skills in geostatistics, modeling, QAQC and sampling with software skills in a variety of mining, database, geostatistical and GIS packages. I'm getting tired just talking about all that stuff that you do. Um, she also has experience as a presenter and teacher of courses in data management and QAQC. Katya, thank you so much for joining us and I'll hand over to you. Thank you very much, Noreen. I do sound like I'm very important, uh, <laughs> which I don't know if I am or not. Anyways, um, good afternoon, everybody. Uh, it's a really interesting format for me because I don't see you all, but hey, it's 21st century and it's an interesting situation. Let's just try to do our best. Well, my name is Katya and I'm a geologist with AMC Consultants. I'm based in Moscow uh, in Russia, but uh, I live in Russia, right? So I know the Russian world and uh, the Russian exploration and mining world is really governed and ruled by the State Committee for Reserves and by the Ministry for Natural Resources. So this is why today I wanted to give this talk on the differences in approaches to data validation between the two systems. So between the geological audit as part of the Kursko public reporting and the Russian JKZ expertise. So JKZ stands for Russian Committee for Reserves. I'm going to turn my video off so my um, face would not disturb you, but I'm going to be back with you when I finish. Uh, so let's move on. All right. Hey, okay. doesn't, doesn't want to move. Let's try. Okay, so here we go. Uh, sorry, it took some time to change the slide. Well, probably all of you know this uh, image of the figure of the balancing geologist. Uh, he's trying to stabilize this overturned pyramid of sophisticated modeling that is based on unverified data. So is the geologist's data in fact precise and accurate? Does the data contain only random errors so the balancing geologist would keep his legs and steady the pyramid? Having done, of course, some outstanding somersaults, the consequences of each would inevitably come out. They would just not be buried anywhere. So is there bias concealed in the sound looking data? So says the geologist's head. And the rumble from the fall of the pyramid will excite the surroundings despite all the geologist's acrobatic efforts. We would not know the future of our fellow geologist and his pyramid unless we assess the quality of his data. So data validation is a critical step to ensure it is clean, correct, and thus it is useful for any resource estimates and of course general project assessment as well. So having stated this, it's interesting to know that approaches to data validation are different between the Kriersko type reporting and the JKZ in Russia. 
In order to understand why, we have to look a little bit into history. So uh, in South Africa, you live in uh, what we call the Western world. It doesn't matter what part of the world you are. For Russians, everything that's not Russia, it's the Western world. And in the Western world, the Committee for Mineral Reserves, International Reports and Standards, they rule the industry. All of you know the JOR code, the uh, Canadian NI43101 uh, form, of course, the SAMREC code. We also have our own code, the Russian code. Uh, nobody actually uses it too much. Uh, however, this is what we know in the Western world. I believe that the history of the Russian Committee for Reserves is an enigma for most of you. So how it all began. After the revolution in 1918, the Soviet government nationalized all land and industry. So now everything belonged to the state. There was no private land or no private, mm, I don't know, plants, uh, roads, nothing. Then we would have a question. Who would take responsibility for determining the volume of reserves and the volume of state funds for their development? This is a question for the mining industry. So as this question arose, in 1927, the State Committee for Reserves was established. In 1963, JKZ starts reviewing and approving feasibility studies and evaluating the industrial significance of deposits. So on the right, you see this is a first uh, image of my uh, favorite series of uh, Soviet posters. It's from 1959, and it's a chest. And uh, on the chest, you, you have a word Siberia. So this man, he opens this magnificent chest with the word Siberia on it. And the poster says, let's open the storerooms of nature. So in the 50s was the most uh, rich time for uh, geologists when a lot of the deposits that are currently mined were first discovered and started being explored. What about now? What are the modern functions of the State Committee for Reserves in Russia? In 1991, we had another, well, let's call it another revolution, and the consolidated state mining and geological complex completely collapsed. The tasks of exploration and development of deposits were transferred to private capital. But, however, the JKZ protocol, this document you see on the right, it is still a mandatory legal approval to move the project from exploration to design and licensing. So although you may, as a private investor, spend all your money on years of exploration and you want to invest in mining this project, you have to actually prove the state committee for reserves that it, is, that it deserves being mined. Whereas at the same time, uh, the public reports that are written and uh, published according to the Kriersko codes, they are key to attract foreign investment, with exception of China, of course, because uh, well, uh, Chinese investors are happy to read the, the Russian reports. They have a very similar reporting system to the one we have in Russia. So some Russian companies, they are forced to reporting in two systems. And this is... Uh, especially uh, you can see it for the major companies. They have to uh, report both for the JKZ and for uh, public reporting. And the company may, in the end of the day, be surprised to have different results of what seemed to be the same process of geological audit, but that was carried out according to different standards and for different purposes. This is surprising, but it's the way it is. So now let's look at data validation, the Kriersko approach. The Kriersko International Family of Codes, they are mandatory for public reporting and they provide a list of all areas that must be addressed, leaving the assessment of the procedures and data validation and the details of reporting to the professional judgment on this uh, good looking person on the right, who is the CP or the QP, the, the competent person or the qualified person. And this Soviet poster says, be vigilant. This is what the competent person should be because he takes responsibility of what is there in the report. What about the Russian approach, the JKZ approach? So the JKZ system of reporting on mineral resources and ore reserves, it is very strictly regulated. And here you see a list of, uh, well, it's just part of the 
the big list of requirements that we have to follow. And these requirements and regulations, they tell you everything that you should do, what you should do, how you should do to have a reserve published for your, um, for your deposit. So for example, if you have a copper project, uh, there would be a regulation on exactly what the drilling grid should be for uh, this type of copper deposit in order to allocate a certain resource category to, to it. So everything's regulated. So on the right, you see this happy Soviet uh, person holding a book. So everything is in the book. You don't really have to invent the wheel as we say, right? What is the JKZ expertise? Well, it's something like a thesis defense because the JKZ experts, they work with a finalized version of a technical report that has been written by either the company who has this project, right? Or some sub consulting company that specializes in technical reports for JKZ. So the expert reviews the report based on his or her experience and knowledge of the project and the review itself is, well, surprisingly, not limited by any documents. So nobody tells the expert what he or she should do. There's not a list of, you know, like a checklist of things that should be done by the expert. But if the expert identifies deviations from the methodological documents, or if he sees some doubtful conclusions, he would ask for some additional uh, data. So he would send requests for the company. But really digging deep into primary data as required by the Crisco reporting codes and which is beyond the scope of the report is not part of the regular JKZ expertise. What happens next? After the JKZ experts review uh, the reports, they write their notes and send their requests and the company which submits the report, they should fulfill all these comments and uh, write answers and all this. But in the end of the day, you would have a defense. So which uh, on the right, you see this uh, Soviet defense. What is this defense and why we need this defense? Uh, well, there's this long official definition why we need the expertise uh, in general and why this defense is needed. Uh, it's mainly for the st state record keeping of mineral reserves and license areas. What is state record keeping? So our government should understand if we're uh, lacking uh, reserves for lithium, for example, then we should go and explore some uh, lithium deposits because we know that in 10 years, uh, there's going to be no lithium in Russia. So the government uh, still is in charge of these uh, strategic uh, decisions. However, you see, where, where's the assessing the reliability of information? It's really in the end of the list. And this is why on this slide here, I again see this phantom of the balance trying to stabilize this pyramid, right? Because data, where's the data? I don't see where's, where's the data. It's somewhere in the end. Well, uh, now going deep into the data, we're trying to validate it and verify it. These are the usual validation steps that should be accomplished in order to prove that your data, your data is accurate and precise. It's the site visit, it's the data collection audit, it's the data collation, it's the QAQC results verification, and it's the database verification as well. So let's just run through these steps briefly. The site visit. This is the crucial difference between the two systems because during the JKZ expertise, the expert would not go on a site visit. The expert works with a, fi with a ver final version of the report. There's no time or ability to go to site. Whereas the CRISCO type reporting, the site visit is mandatory for public reporting on mineral resources and or reserves. Well, what do we do in the field? The field audit comprises a review of the whole chain of exploration activities and their results, of course, starting from the topo base and finishing with uh, what laboratory you're using, what methods you're using, what's the digestion, and all this. So quickly running through these steps. What do we do in the field? We check for methods of georeferencing trenches, underground workings, and collars. 
we check coordinates on site with the GPS. We actually have to prove that these holes exist. We look at drill hole serving methods, their accuracy and equipment use. We look at trenches, how were they uh, well, dug out. We look at uh, technical de details like core diameters for drilling. We look at logging procedures for trench surface outcrops and underground walls. We review practices for determining core recovery. We look at geological control during, during drilling and marking core at the drill site, which is very important. What else do we do? We look at how the core is being laid out. We look at methods of core transportation and measures taken to ensure the core integrity. We look at core logging, including the inspection of the logging facility and reviewing the experience of geologists who are doing the logging. So on the right, this is one of my uh, pictures uh, from my exploration days. And the young girl is being guided by this uh, lady a geologist who worked on this project for many years and who knows exactly what the logging procedures are, what the lithological and alteration uh, types are. And so th this is a very good example of how it works. What else do we review? We review the use of the XRF express analysis, the presence of logging procedures and codes for all categories, and of course, some photo logging. We look at geotechnical logging procedures, the methods for measuring density. So on the right, it's a very good example. Why I put it inside in here, uh, because uh, on one of the sites, I asked the local geologists, well, how do you do density measurement? And they started explaining me something because they didn't have uh, a well-defined procedures. So this geologist, he had to take a, a pa paper and a pen and actually draw what they were doing. I, I thought that this is a very good example, so I put it in here. Also sampling techniques in the field and their correspondence to the company standard operational procedures. Then we go and look at sample preparation. We first of all look at measures taken to ensure sample representativeness. We look at core splitting techniques, the presence of a marking line for core cutting and who is responsible for marking the core, the position of the cutting line. Sample preparation facility and flow sheet audit. Then we look at data collection as part of the analysis, right? Analytical laboratory audits, some analytical procedures and protocols and their detailed documentation and sample storage and security. These are some shocking images. And this is my favorite probably slide of all this presentation. You see how things can be carried out. Probably for you, um, these images would be shocking, but uh, this is, uh, just some examples from real projects from all over the world. On the right, you see a base basketball net on the fire assay furnace. So probably this furnace is not used for, uh, for the purposes it was put there. Uh, a magnificent scale, this is actually an old scale that they used to use in uh, Soviet supermarkets, but hey, they're measuring uh, sample weight with this scale. A very, very dirty sample preparation facility right here in from Tajikistan and a poor, poor uh, sample uh, storage area where, well, all the samples were just um, destroyed by the air and by the, the wind and some rain. And on the left, you see uh, cardboard uh, core boxes. So these boxes, they are going to disintegrate within uh, the upcoming several years. This is something that we should not experience in real life whatsoever. Uh, then, depending on the reliance of historical or even recent sampling, the auditor may take verification samples. This is uh, the situation which, where, what, that you get sometimes where there's no core anymore. Uh, you see here on the right, the core is just uh, swimming under the water somewhere on the ground. On the left, uh, this uh, fire assay uh, setup is just not reliable. So the expert, the, the expert would uh, take some verification samples as uh, seen here on the right. So data collation. How do we do data collation? Uh, within the framework of the JKZ expertise, the need for the collation of data with primary materials is decided by the expert. But what is usually done is the expert 
uh, collates the data that he gets as a database to the actual paper logs that were filled on, on the site. That's what you see on the left here. Whereas during the audit underlying the public reports team, the correspondence of the database to the primary drill logs, and more importantly, to actual in situ geology, is verified in the field based on the core reject samples, as you see on the right here, some beautiful core. Well, uh, this is an example of one of the projects I worked on where we had to digitize uh, the cross sections in order to come up with the uh, geological and resource model for the deposit. And this situation is not very good, and I'm going to tell you why. Because the 3D models with historical exploration, they're often built on these digitized sections and plans, but the sections and plans themselves, they represent someone's geological and structural interpretation. So as a consequence, your geological model and interpretation should also be checked against the database, against the actual numbers, as opposed to very nice looking drawings. QAQC results. What's the approach that the JKZ uses? Well, JKZ is very regulated. Uh, so you also have a list of these documents that tell you what exactly you should do and how you should do it in terms of QAQC. But uh, the most important document is the one on the, on the bottom here, the OST4100, uh, sorry, 08. It uh, this document is used to, to validate the analytical results, and it is assay only. It doesn't deal with anything else, so it deals with only assay results. So there's no opportunity to catch errors during the program as it goes on, and I'm going to tell you why on the next slide here. This OST, it requires that not less than 5% of the pulp duplicates are reanalyzed at the primary laboratory, and this represents internal QC. And it's aimed at checking the reproducibility of assay results. When the samples pass the quality criteria for the internal QC, and we're only talking about duplicates here, then they are sent to a reputable umpire laboratory for additional check analysis. And this is what they call external QC. And it's aimed at checking for bias that the primary lab may introduce to your routine assay results. This is a regular thing that happens uh, throughout the public reporting world. Check analysis. It's very good and it's magnificent. However, these batches for internal and external quality control, they're formed by uh, dividing the great populations. So you see here an example exactly from this OST uh, where you have uh, great classes for gold. Uh, on the right here, it's cobalt. And you see uh, percent uh, ranges in percents here. And these numbers here, they tell you exactly what the precision should be for each grade class. So you don't have to invent anything. Uh, it's all here. Uh, don't look for numbers somewhere on the internet. Don't read 5 million reports to decide if it corresponds to your deposit. Everything is well organized for you. But these batches, they're being formed and sent to check analysis very rarely. So it's once a quarter, so at once every three months, every half year, Every year, it depends on the number of the routine samples that are analyzed during this period under control. And this document, the OST 4108, it doesn't postulate the use of certified reference materials or blanks. However, it does provide methods for analyzing them. And the data, it, that's the way it's written in this document, the data is to be accumulated and reviewed in the same manner as the internal and external duplicate results. So at the end of this long period, well, this allows estimating the general levels of accuracy and precision within this period. However, it makes it very hard to trace the problems to certain sample batches or to solve the problems promptly as we should. The voluminous tables of internal and external quality control results, they are provided as appendices to the JKZ reports on reserves. And this is an example from a report from 1992, but it, it's all the same. It, it will be the same situation if you open 
just a report from last year. So you see here, uh, 1986, 1987, first half year, second half year, and th these are pages where you can get the results for the duplicate check analysis. Uh, 88, 89, so you see every, uh, every half year for this exactly project. And this is on the right, uh, you see what the actual analysis of these results looks like. So we have 43 samples here. Uh, these are pulp duplicates, and this is the result of the internal quality control. So you resub resubmit the sample batch to your primary lab, and you have a formula uh, that allows you to estimate relative standard deviation. And then when you get this number, the 8%, you go back to that table where they show you which numbers are acceptable, and you compare the two numbers. And bingo, everything's all right, everybody's happy. Well, when you actually plot this data, very often you see this situation where between the data points, you have some weird gaps. These gaps, uh, they uh, represent some uh, outliers that were cleaned out of these data sets. And the OST, so this document itself, it actually tells you that there, if there are outliers in your data, before you actually start analyzing it, please remove the outliers. However, the, this document, the OST, doesn't say provide a list of outliers that were removed. So if you uh, are certain that uh, you have several outliers, you just remove them, your results are very good, uh, you get A, a plus uh, for this uh, year for QAQC and you're happy. And nobody asks you, how many samples were actually sent for the check analysis? Well, this QC accumulation and analysis at the reporting stage after half of year, it contradicts the proactive purpose of the QAQC procedures. So the idea behind the use of quality control samples is to provide the ability to instantly identify and address any problems that are associated with individual batches of samples. An industry best practice for the career score reporting is to provide the auditors with the results of routinely and blindly inserted control samples. You see on the right here, uh, this is my figure I created, and it reflects of the situation that you get where you have to cover all stages working with the sample, the sampling stage, sample preparation, and analysis, and all the quality control samples that help you to investigate were there any errors introduced during this stage. So you have your field duplicate, your course blank, course duplicate, pulp duplicate, pulp blank, certified reference materials, and independent QAQC audit for resource evaluation under the Crisco code. It's not, all, not just limited to assay data. It all comprises a review of principles that are applied to density data as well. So it's a, it's a, it's a vast field that that's being covered by the career score reporting codes. Now we're jumping to database verification. So while the database verification is not regulated in the JKZ expertise, the international audit usually involves comparing, well, approximately five to 10% of records in the database with their original values in the analytical certificates, as well as collating all the outlier grade results. This is very important and this is rarely carried out at the resource modeling stage, and it should be carried out, where you collate all the outlier grades with the original certificates. In addition, the database is checked for non-numeric values in the assay data used for resource modeling. And the lady here does exactly this. Here's a table that summarizes everything that I was going running through uh, in the previous slides. Let's just see. On the left are data validation steps. So the site visit, data collection, data collation, QAQC, and database verification. Jake has expertise, no site visit undertaken. Audit for public reporting, site visit is mandatory. Data collection, the data collection procedures are reviewed in the report for the JKZ expertise and checked for compliance with industry standard regulations and requirements. For the career score type audit, the data collation, collection sorry, procedures are checked for compliance with the industry best practice in the judgment of the QP or the CP. Data collection, random inspection for the JKZ expertise, 
not less than 10% of the data for the international audit. And 10% is just a very usual number that they use. KQC results, 100% inspection of data provided in the report for the JKZ report with no deviations from the regulations or grave errors are detected. If no, sorry, if no deviations from the regulations or grave errors are detected. So for international audit, verification against primary logs and assay certificates, sample preparation and assay lab audits. This is very important. Database verification is not regulated during the JKZ expertise and it's integral part of the international audit. So I really like this figure here on the right. Uh, it says uh, friendship has a strong arm. You know, these two systems, they try to meet somewhere in the middle. And uh, I believe actually that they would meet at some point. And I'm gonna tell you why. Uh, I believe that the JORC code is one of the Pierce code codes. It's becoming more regulated. Uh, we had the table uh, table one for JORC in the 2012 edition. So it's becoming a little bit more regulated. Whereas the Russian system, it uptakes uh, a lot of the ideas of the QAQC, of the sampled, uh, quality control samples and all stages. But currently, the Russian JKZ system is set to check the data provided in the reserves reports for compliance with industry standard regulations. And uh, it doesn't really question the reliability or the completeness of the primary data. Checking if the assumed protocols are correctly implemented, it's, it represents a reactive approach to geological data review. On the contrary, geological audit as part of the Clearsco public reporting, it's aimed at the identification of site or geology specific issues and modifying of protocols. So we don't just check if the protocols are uh, there and uh, everything's carried out okay, everybody's happy. No, we actually provide some ideas of how we should modify things so they would work better. And it constitutes a proactive approach to geological data review. They would meet somewhere in the middle. I, I hope they would. So, collating, collecting and validating data both in the field and through verifications by the desktop studies, it's a fundamental stage in resource estimation and or reserve calculation, as we say in Russian, we calculate reserves. The drilling data and a well-constructed verified drill hole database is the primary fundamental asset of the company and the project. So irrespective of the necessity to prepare a public report in order to attract some financing, an independent audit is very important because it is necessary and it will allow the company to ensure that the resource modeling for the deposit is based on precise, accurate, and reliable data. And without quality data, the company will not have a robust mineral resource or, or reserve. And it will definitely result in poor project performance during the mining stage. So here, I want to turn my camera on and uh, uh, do this. Yes, so let there not be any need for a geologist to balance like an acrobat. Let all the geologists do their work right and be certain in its outcomes. And happy Geologist Day. I'm a bit late with it. Uh, it's been two weeks <laughs> uh, after the Geologist Day. It's uh, usually first Sunday of April. We're a bit late, but hey, we're still geologists and we're still trying to do our job right. Uh, sorry, my next slide doesn't come up. And it's where I say Happy Geologist Day. Hey, here we go. Happy Geologist Day, everybody. And if you have any questions, um, please feel free to ask. And I thank you for your attention. Thank you very much for your presentation. Um, I'll you. open the, the, the session now to questions and comments. We have 40 participants. Um, are there any questions or or comments? You can unmute your mic, please, and uh, fire away. We've got one here. That's me. Thank you very much for a, a fantastic talk. I thought it was well presented and, and very thorough. I have a question about um, 
the comparison that you showed us on slide 27, when you mentioned um, that data collection procedures are checked uh, against industry best practice. And my question is, is that best practice codified anywhere? Is it written down as a, in a book? Is it um, guarded by any societies that shared on a regular basis? Or is it more just a perception that people have that they share with each other socially? Uh, well, it's both actually. So we're talking on the right for the international audit. Uh, the industry best practice is something that everybody knows should be done the way it, it should be done. But actually there's a gigantic book that I took this uh, figure of the balancing geologist from. It's from 2014. It's the latest edition of the OZIMM Guide to Good Practice. Uh, I think it's about 900 pages thick, this book. Uh, it's very important to, uh, to read uh, because it has answers to a lot of the questions. But these are recommendations of how things should be carried out. And every time you see another project, these recommendations, they may change. And this is what's so special about uh, having uh, a qualified or a competent person uh, that knows the history of this deposit, that understands the type of this deposit, that understands the mineralization to take responsibility and to advise what the best procedures for this project should be. So it's, it's really both. This uh, gigantic book, it, um, it's written not by one author, but by many authors, which are uh, experts in their fields. So would be, there would be a, uh, an author for sampling, an author for QAQC, for resource evaluation, and every, every, every subject. So does that- Okay, thank you. Yes, I'm it sorry. does. Thank you very much. Thank you. Any other questions or comments? Adrian? I am. Uh, Craig, it's okay. Go ahead. Sorry, Adrian, Andy, Andy Clay, how are you? Go, you go ahead. Um, you find the CIM, the Canadian, also have a, a best practice, um, a suite of three different best practices: um, exploration and resource estimation, and something else. I can't remember the other one. So go to cim.org, and you'll find that sort of stuff there. Yes, that's that's a very good comment. I just used York as an example. Also, what I know, uh, I, I do it too, and I, I know a lot of uh, geologists do the same thing. They go to CEDAR. CEDAR is a website that has all the NI43101 reports for various projects, and it's a gigantic database that you, sh you can use to, well, find answers to any questions that you may have for certain deposit types, for certain stages of exploration or, uh, you know, stages. It's a very important database. Andy, did you have something? Yeah, Craig, I've just got a chopper flying over the house. Katrina, a brilliant presentation, really enjoyed it. But um, just like to ask a couple of questions. The first one is that um, I think I've noticed that there's a propensity now just to follow table one which effectively is common to most of the codes now, and make sure that that's filled out in detail. But uh, the question I'd like to ask you is that in your last couple of slides, you used the terms verified and validated, which from a uh, English language perspective um, means quite a lot in terms of um, responsibility. Uh, and I currently uh, work alongside an audit firm and they would never use those words verified and validated. Um, and in fact, verify, I think, is only used a couple of times in the Crisco codes. One where it talks about assumed but not verified uh, geological information for inferred resources. And I think one in the sampling section of table one. So I just wanted to ask you in terms of if you were signing off uh, from AMC about the uh, QAQC and the, and the data validation, to what extent are you using verify and validate? It's a very good question because these terms are not really well translated into Russian <laughs> as well. 
probably because we don't carry out these things. We have so-called zavierka, which is uh, something like validation, but when you actually check something that was uh, carried out long ago. Um, so, yeah, well, um, Mm, it's a, a little bit of uh, philosophy here. So um, every project is different and uh, it depends on what data I am provided. If I call it a validated or verified data, validated is actually when I have, is in my understanding, if, if I actually checked, uh, if I have some check samples and they show me the same results. Whereas verified is when I go and see, yeah, it, this is, it, it exists. Um, so Katrina, Katrina, I've actually just put in a request to the SAMREC uh, Sambal committee for a formal um, clarification on the, the, the use of this wording, uh, verify and validate or review, check and, um, and, and um, uh, test. Uh, mm -hmm. Because the, the, the first time that this is going to become a problem is when it goes to court. And somebody says, you verified and validated, which have very strong legal implications in terms of, um, of the law. So it's under review. But thanks. Yeah, it's very interesting. Thank you for this question. I, uh, yeah, the, the terms, uh, the words, they matter. That's a good answer. I think we have a, uh, Enrique has his, has his hand up. Hi, Katrina, this is Enrique in Peru, South America. It's a very nice presentation. My question is related to percentage of QAQC samples that will be inserted. It's depend of the, the, the stage of the project, for example, you need to insert more percentage of quality QAQC samples in early stage projects than in advan uh, advanced projects, or is the same percentage? What is your opinion? Uh, well, my opinion is that you have to be smart in why you're inserting your quality control uh, samples, uh, because every project is different. And what is the purpose of your current exploration activity? Are you trying to find some investment? So then everything, if you just started drilling and you have five drill holes and you have to prove an investor that this project has a lot of potential, then I would be inserting certified reference materials a lot more often than I would do on stages uh, when everybody's uh, pretty certain that this yes, exists and, and, and all that. So it really depends. It depends on what uh, commodity you're working with. Either it's gold or it's uh, I don't know, something completely Basically different. copper, maybe an example. Uh, copper, yes. What type of uh, deposit? Uh, did you choose your uh, uh, standards we about right? Scar. Uh, scar and deposit. Uh, how many yeah. standards you have? So it, it, it really depends on the project. But I believe that uh, if, uh, if you're trying, and there's always a problem of money saving right because standard reference materials they cost a lot of money uh, yeah. Be because because uh, for my experience i have 20 years of experience all the experts in qqc uh, and this kind of, of methodologies uh, are proposed that you have to insert more qqc control i mean blanks duplicate and the standard in the early stage deposits than advanced state deposit. I mean, for example, for early state deposit, you can insert a 20% of the QAQC sample, of the of all the samples uh, in early stage deposit and 10% in advantage uh, the, uh, stage. Is, is that for my experience? Well, because you need to, to, you it, need it to, to a stay 100% sure in this, in the early stage, uh, in the early stage project, no? Yes, uh, this is exactly what I was saying, that you have to uh, prove yourself and everybody else that uh, everything is set up right and you do have your mineralization. That's why we need to have a lot of QAQC samples on the initial stages. Uh, whereas when it's an advanced stage of exploration, you already know your, uh, your uh, weak sites, let's put it that way, right? So you would not 
or your strong side. So you would not be inserting coarse blanks uh, every 20 samples because you know that your sample prep facility, it already operates on, on a good level. So you, you would minimize the coarse blanks at this stage, right? But whereas at the initial stage where you just uh, met this uh, subcontractor for sample preparation, you have no idea what's going on, you would have to insert a lot of the course blanks. So as a, as a starting point, that's, that's my understanding. Okay, Katrina, many thanks. Thank you. Um, we have a, Taryn has her hand up. Yeah, hi. Um, thanks very much for the talk. I think it was a um, really nice overview. Um, what I wanted to ask is, do you know if there's a version of, of the requirements, the GKZ requirements in English some way, or worst case, is the Russian available publicly or not? Uh, the, the Russians are definitely available publicly. Uh, they should be somewhere on the GKZ website. If not, uh, you should send me an email. There's my uh, email on the first page of this presentation and I can forward you the documents in Russian. To tell you the truth, I never experienced uh, a problem of uh, finding the English version. Uh, I'm, I'm not certain uh, if it exists. <laughs> Thanks. <laughs> yeah, but yeah, it, I, would, I would ask. I would ask definitely. So you can email me and I would find this out. I will do. Thank you. Any other questions or comments at this point? Maybe just one final one from me. Um, as somebody who's never been involved too terribly closely in this kind of business, I have to ask you, which system do you prefer? Or is it a question of uh, one system is better for uh, different types of deposits? Um, I Which would say, system? <laughs> I would say I prefer this, this image here. I would prefer them to meet somewhere. Well, the, the latest, uh, Jork edition, uh, that has, uh, the table one, it's more definitive. So it's a lot, um, better to report, uh, right now, you, you know what you should write about and how it should be, uh, implied into a report and what areas should be covered and what exactly fields you should look into. Uh, whereas the previous versions were, were a bit uh, vague from my perspective. The JKZ system is very well set up. Uh, it's, um, it, it works very well, right? Unless you have a deposit of some unusual geology or nature, then you have a big problem because all these procedures and all these regulations, they would not, they don't accept exceptions. <laughs> Let's put it that way, right? And you would have to prove really hardly that your deposit is worth mining. Um, because it would not, like if you have coarse gold, you would never meet the JKZ requirements for the assay results because it's just coarse gold and it, the precision would be horrible. Whereas the Clearsco type reporting, they understand that this is exactly the deposit of this nature that would have coarse gold. So we expect the precision to be plus minus 30% for, for these duplicates, for example. So I hope they would meet somewhere, <laughs> the two systems. Well, thank you for that. It sounds a little bit like horses for courses. Are there any other questions or comments before uh, Nolene, can I hand back over to you? Yes. So we have one. Yeah. Uh, uh, thank you for this interesting presentation. Can I ask, how do you quantify the risk associated with audit and the share with this risk in the, in the risk associated with the mineral resource statement? Excuse me, uh, the risks associated with mineral resource statements? Yeah, how, uh, when you do your audit, how you quantify the risk associated with this audit? And in addition to that, 
the share of this risk in the total risk associated with the mineral resource statement. Yes, well, this is where your uh, QAQC results tell you exactly what your uh, what the what the errors are, right? If it's either plus minus thirty percent or it's plus minus minus ten percent, that's your that's your precision that you should expect to see uh, for sampling results. And when you start modeling, you add extra errors. So in the end of the day, quality control really influences the resource categories that the project would get. And this is uh, exactly what, what the understanding of the qualified person would be for this certain area of the certain deposit based on QAQC results. Uh, the resource category would tell you exactly the understanding of uh, the reliability of the data for this certain part. Uh, and this is uh, the assessment of risk that lies within the either indicated or inferred categories. That's and and the stage, of course, of of the project. If it's a scoping study, then you would accept some some mistakes in uh, QC data. If it's a PFS, you would be more concerned and you would really evaluate the risks more strictly. Is that, is that answered to your question? I mean, we can determine the severity and the probability. So we can determine the magnitude of the risk. We can, we can. Uh, based on QAQC results, you understand what, what's the variance in, uh, in results of sampling is. And this variance influences the, the categories of resource estimates and the, the how much the competent person is certain about the results. So th that's an assessment of the risk. Okay, thank you. Tanya, I think you've got your hand up. Hi, Katerina. The question I wanted to ask is with respect to diamond deposits. How applicable is the, uh, the, the GKZ to diamond deposits? And if not, what do you use in order to evaluate such deposits? No, there, there's a very detailed uh, document for evaluating diamond deposits as well. Unfortunately, I've never worked with diamond deposits. It's just not part of my uh, history for now. Maybe I, in the future I would uh, work on some of them. But uh, there's a special document uh, as part of the JKZ methodological uh, requirements that you should follow to uh, report the reserves for diamonds. So it's, it's a well set system as well. Thank you very much for that. Okay. Um, with that, can I hand over to Nalini? Thank you very much, Kati. Uh, that was a really interesting talk and I'd like to thank everybody for joining us today. Um, enjoy your evening. Thanks very much. Thank you. Thanks very much, everybody. I'll, I'll, I'll end the meeting now. Thank you. Goodbye. Thank you. Thanks Bye. very much. Goodbye. Thank you very much. Goodbye.